All right, now it is. First Peter chapter number three. Been in a series uh, entitled One Another and basically walking through the different one another's of Scripture. Uh, most of the time, the one another, uh, the phrase one another is preceded by a command. So love one another, be kind one to another. Um, this one is not necessarily a command, but as much as a principle for how to interact with someone else. And so I want to take you to this passage and we'll kind of use this and then we'll close with one more passage in Jude. But today we're going to look at having compassion one of another or compassion one for another, however you would like to phrase that. We'll begin reading in 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 8. The Bible says this, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil. I love when it says be pitiful. How many of you as a good southern person, you've heard somebody when they see like a little kid crying, and you, oh, that's pitiful. How many of you have ever heard someone say that? All right. My grandma did not say pitiful. She said pitiful. All right. And so she kind of like turned it into like a five syllable word or whatever. All right. But be pitiful. I don't think that's what it's talking about. All right. We'll talk about that in just a second. Be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is the he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I want you to go back and read verse number 8 out loud together with me, verse number 8, and we'll also go and read verse number 15, the verse that we closed with. Verse number 8, ready, begin. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Verse number 15, out loud together, ready, begin. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Reading out loud is one of the most difficult things that you can do, mainly because sometimes when I'm reading out loud with a group, I feel like I need a breath, and I'm like, oh, I hope everybody else needs a breath at the same time that I do. But it is also a biblical thing to do, and so some of you might wonder why we do that. Uh, most of the time, Scripture, not most of the time, all the time that you see Scripture show up in the Old Testament when it was given to a group of people, it was read out loud together. And so um, we want to make a good practice of that. But let's pray, and we'll talk for the next couple of minutes about having compassion one for another. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the day that you've given us. We thank you for your word. We thank you so much for just the timeliness of your word. Lord, it still is mind-boggling to me that a book that is this ancient somehow is just so applicable and relevant to where we are at day in and day out as human beings in 2022. Lord, I pray that you would help us as Christians to rise to the top as in application. Lord, may we never be guilty of saying that we believe your word and not practicing it. Lord, I pray that you would help us to apply this truth to our lives. Lord, may we live differently and interact with other Christians differently as a result of what we hear today. Lord, may we walk out of these doors changed. Lord, may you help us. Lord, I pray that you would empty me of myself, fill me with your spirit. Lord, give me the words to say. In your name we pray. Amen. When you look at our society, so much of it revolves around taking the complex and making it simple. One of the things that we look at when we really look at the way that our world has changed the last 20 to 30 years is that it was supposed to take these great big things and make them so much more simple. We 
created the end. Not we. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. All right. If I had anything to do with it, it would not be this good. But we created the internet to make things more simple. We supposedly created smartphones to keep thing to make things more simple. We created social media to make relationships and all of these things much more simple. The goal was to take something that seems to be so complex and so kind of unattainable and make it much more simple. And isn't it interesting that in our attempt to make the complex simple, we have actually made complex the things which were very simple. And sometimes in Christianity, we have the same case. We have the same, uh, I guess, uh, if you want to say, we, you could judge us the same way to, uh, by that statement, all right? Sometimes we have a way of taking what is very simple and making it very complex. We want to sit around and we want to talk about Christianity. We want to talk about our faith. We want to make sure that we understand every nuance of Christianity. And yet sometimes Christianity can just be boiled down to simple principles. And in this passage, what you have is you have verse number 15 that we love to quote as a proof text for why we need to understand everything, all right? And I love verse number 15. Verse number 15 is the rallying cry for a lot of Christian apologetics, as it should be. But isn't it interesting that one of the verses that we use to delve into, as a proof text to delve into the complex, is preceded by such fundamental and simple principles, such simple commands. It is bookend, verse number 15, if you want to look at that as one bookend, and then verses 1 through 7 as another bookend. It is bookend by marriage counseling and a call to have an answer for everyone. In between those verses are these simple callings to be compassionate one of another, to be loving, to be pitiful, to be courteous, to not offer evil for evil, but to actually offer blessing for evil. And here's what I would propose to you today, is that if you can give an answer for everything that your faith stands upon, and yet you have an attitude that does not match your faith, you have nothing to stand upon. And sometimes as Christians, what we are guilty of doing is we're guilty of having an answer for everything, but not having an attitude that matches the attitude of Christ. Just this week, I was kind of contemplating some things, and even in my own life, and I was kind of taking a mental evaluation and just kind of looking at even how I was leading our own family, how I was leading my children, how I was leading those around me. And I've been blessed to have some very strong leaders in my life, very strong pastors, very, very strong and influential people. And one of the things that I look at is that the things that I appreciate the most in the leaders in my life are those that act Christ-like, even if I may disagree with their with maybe their decision. It doesn't take a very strong person to be kind to someone who agrees with them. It takes a very strong spiritual person to be kind to those who disagree with them. And one of the things that you will find in this life is this, is that you will very rarely find someone to interact with that you 100% agree with. And here's what I would encourage you with. I believe that your Christianity and your spirituality is more on display in the attitude of how you interact with those who disagree with you than you are those who agree with you. Meaning this, that you can have an answer for everything that you do, and you may be right, but how your attitude shows up can completely negate that which you believe. And in this passage, here's what I want us to see. I want us to see three quick steps for showing compassion one to another. The first one is this. It's the call to compassion in verse number eight. The call to compassion. He says this. He says, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. This is a call to all Christians. Verses one through seven is actually, like I've already said, it's marriage counseling. It's talking about husbands and wives. It's talking about having a relationship with each other. But he stops and he moves to a different phase in verse number 8. And he says, we're no longer talking about husbands and wives. Now we're talking about everybody. Meaning this, that this is not something that is just for a mature Christian. This is not something that's just for a married Christian. 
This is something that is for everyone. This is something that is not just for your relationships with other Christians. One of these days when you get married, this is a call to your marriage relationship. One of these days when you become a supervisor or you're a boss or you're an employer, this is a call to your, how you interact with your employees. One of these days when you are maybe a college student or you go back to classes or you are currently a college student, this is a call to how you interact with fellow classmates. And he says this, Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as Brethren, can I ask you a very simple but deep and probing question this morning? Does your love look more like brotherly love or does it look like worldly love? Does it look more like brotherly love or does it look more like worldly love? It's interesting to me the way that my son interacts with his little sisters, okay? He absolutely loves and adores Blakely, our little one-year-old. And he absolutely cannot stand Baylor, our little five-year-old, all right? Baylor, for whatever reason, I guess she's just a little bit too close to him in age. Even in the car this morning, we have a four-minute drive to church, all right? And Baylor was wanting to, she colored something, and she goes, Braxton, look at, at this. She goes, is that Scribble Scrabble? And Braxton goes, yes, that's Scribble Scrabble. And I'm like, Brax, just throw her a bone, dude. Like, like just, and like Baylor's like, oh, he said it was Scribble Scrabble. And it just like broke her little heart. And I said, Braxton, like just, he goes, she asked. I was just telling her the truth. And I'm like, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. So this was our conversation on the walk into church. I said, Braxton, I know she asked. I know you want to tell her the truth. He said, she's five. I said, what would be the kind thing to do? I said, wouldn't it just be better for you just to say, oh, Baylor, that looks good. And he goes, yeah, that'd probably be better. <laughs> and it's funny to me that he has moments like that. But on the other hand, he also has moments. She walked out today and Lauren had fixed her hair. And so she was all proud of the way that she looked. And she goes, Dada. And she comes around the corner. I said, oh, baby, you look cute. You look pretty. Like, and we just try to puff her up. And Braxton's sitting there, and he's just looking at me like, and I slapped him on the arm. I said, Braxton, how does Baylor look? He goes, Baylor, you look so cute and so pretty and so beautiful. And I think that everything I just said, Braxton washed away because it was like, now her brother thinks she's cute, and now her brother thinks that she's pretty, and he's ready to take care of her. But that's brotherly love. Now watch this. Sometimes as Christians, we show more of a worldly love to each other than we do a brotherly love. A brotherly love is not perfect, okay? A brotherly love, as I have already demonstrated in just the two conversations that my son had with uh, his sister this morning, okay, is that there was good moments and there was bad moments. But watch this. Brotherly love always comes back down to the connection that you have with them that is much deeper than any of the problems that you have with them. I want to say that again. Brotherly love always comes back down to a deeper level uh, to the connections that you have with them than the problems you have with them. At the end of the day, no matter what Braxton thinks of Baylor's coloring or her dress or her hairstyle, at the end of the day, they are family, meaning this, that they are tied and unified at a deeper level than what coloring and dresses and sports and whatever else he cares about that she doesn't care about. They have a deeper knit than that. And here's what we so often do as Christians, is we look at the problems that we have with one another, and we assume that that negates the deeper connection that we have as family. We see that maybe someone's living a life that we don't agree with. And so what we tend to do is we, we tend to say, oh, well, I'm going to go and talk bad about that person, or I'm going to make sure that everybody knows that I don't agree with them, or I'm going to gossip about them. There are so many people in the Christian life that I disagree with, okay? I've made the joke before that there are times in my week to where I don't even know that I 100% agree with what I do, okay? But at the end of the day, what I know about them is I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. I don't know that there is any justification in this life to speak negatively of another Christian. Sometimes we like to even spiritualize that. Like, well, I just want them to know so they can pray. I'm calling junk on that, all right? That's gossip. That's a sin. 
We like to make other people look bad. Social media has become the worst at this. You guys, oh man, about biffed it right there, okay? You do understand that the verse, let another man praise thee and not thine own lips, was in the Bible before it was in, before social media came along, right? And sometimes what we are so good at doing is we're guilty of praising the Lord through our life. Like, look at how good I am. I have to say, praise the Lord for this, but it's really just an opportunity for you to look at me. We try to make other people look bad on social media. Right now on, on Twitter, and I think the only people who are still on Twitter are ministry people and politicians, all right? Which is probably not a good place to live, if I'm being honest, which is why I delete it very often from my phone, all right? I haven't tweeted in like, I think it's like 18 months or something like that. Maybe it was earlier than that, okay? But what's the big thing right now on Twitter is to try to throw stones at other people who are not like you. I think that sometimes when we stand before God one of these days, I always joke that God's going to make Christians stand in the corner. Like, yeah, you made it to heaven, but you've got to go stand in the corner because of the stuff that you said on social media. And here's the truth about the world that we live in, is that we are so good at showing compassion to those that we agree with and never showing grace and compassion that was shown to us from Jesus Christ to those that we disagree with. And for some of us, here's what we have struggled with over the course of the last two years. The disagreements and the problems of this world have risen to the top, in case you haven't been able to see that, all right? We are now identified by what we believe on certain subjects. It's almost humorous to me that there can be this huge sect of America that believes one thing, but it can be splintered by all of these little other beliefs. And as a Christian, here's what Christ calls us to. He says that there should be compassion one to another on a family and unity level that does not apply to the problems that you have with one another. Is that easy to do? I wish I could stand up here and say that that was super easy to do. Okay, I wish I could stand up here and say that you don't always want to comment on everything that you see on social media. But there's this little thing called the flesh that just makes you want to prove everyone wrong or tell everybody what you know. Can I encourage you with this? That the call is to have compassion one for another. The call is not to prove others wrong. The call is not to tell everybody what you know. The call is to have compassion one for another. So first of all, the call to compassion. But then secondly, let's notice the actions of compassion. You say, okay, I know I'm called to compassion. What does that mean? Good thing the Bible tells us, all right? He says, love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing. Knowing that ye are thereunto called and that ye should inherit a blessing. Those verses are so amazing to me because they're so against the way that we want to react, aren't they? He says to be courteous, to be pitiful. And then he says this, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing. Do you want a good test of your spiritual maturity? Look at the way that you react when someone does you wrong. How did you react when someone did you wrong? Let's just make it even more simple, all right? How did you react when someone cut you off this morning on your way to church? That was too deep. I'm sorry. Let's don't do that one, all right? Too personal. How did you react when maybe someone didn't give you what they said that they were going to do? Didn't show up when they said they were going to show up? How did you react when someone did not fulfill something or an expectation that you felt like that they should, ex- that they should fulfill? Most people don't go around just doing evil to someone. But there's some of you that this week, your greatest frustrations was because someone didn't fulfill that expectation that you placed on them. And he says this, don't respond in evil, respond in blessing. Meaning this, that you as a Christian are not called to react in evil. And let's just, let's just be very honest, okay? Most of the time we react more in evil 
than we do even in neutrality, all right? It would be one thing if we just said, you know what, that person did me wrong, I'm just going to leave it at that. That's not even the calling of Scripture. The calling of Scripture is not to even be neutral, it's to bless, which means this. I see it almost as this three-phase scale. You have evil over here that you can respond with. You have neutral or nothing that you can respond with, or you have blessing that you can respond with. For most of us, evil is done to us, and we live on this side of the scale, don't we? Well, that person hurt me. That person did me wrong. That person said this about me. That person mistreated me, and so I'm going to respond with evil. I'm going to respond. And by the way, everyone accepts that, okay? Oh, man. They hurt you so bad, it doesn't even matter that you're doing something unbiblical because their hurt, the way that they hurt you, justifies your hurt. And so most of the time what we do as human beings is we overlook someone's sin because it's justified because of the way that someone treated them. That's where most of America lives. Now watch this. Then there's neutral. There's nothing. Most people will even stand up and say, wow, you are the bigger person. I'm so... like." I, if someone did that to me, boy, you better bet that I would live in evil. And neutrality is what gets everybody to say, wow, yeah, I, I just can't believe that you haven't even chosen to do anything back, to say anything back. But then there's this scale of Christianity that just pushes the limits even more. To where there's not evil, it's not neutrality, it's actually blessing. And I think that the reason why most people do not step back and see how great of a faith and Christianity we have is because most of us don't live in blessing. We live either in neutrality or in evil. And neither of those depict the heart and spirit of Jesus Christ. Blessing is the only thing that depicts the spirit of Christ. So first of all, there's the call to compassion. Secondly, there's the actions of compassion. It goes through the list there. It says, not rendering evil for evil, but blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. But then the last thing that I want you to see and where we'll spend the rest of our time is this, is the impact of compassion. The impact of compassion. I want you to skip down to verse number 12. He says, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers but the face of the lord is against them that do evil and who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good but and if ye suffer for righteousness sake happy are ye and be not afraid of their terror neither be troubled he says this if you suffer for doing right what does it matter why would that be something that would be wrong? Can I just encourage you with this before we go to one more passage? It's a very simple statement. It's one that has been said throughout the history of time, is that it is never right to do wrong, and it is never wrong to do right. I would rather lose doing right than win doing wrong. In fact, here a couple years ago, I think it was the first year my son played basketball. There was a rule that was kind of hazy, and it was about playing time and whatever else. And so we ended up putting, like, I was the one who was on the, I think I wasn't even the one that was on the bench. I think it was on the court. And we followed the rule. And we ended up losing a tournament game because of it. And I, I think that at that, that year we probably had the team to beat. We lost the first round of our tournament game because we followed a rule. And afterwards, I was talking to my son about it, and he goes, Dad, if you wouldn't have done this and you wouldn't have done that, like, if you wouldn't, have, and like, he's like in tears about it. He's just, he like couldn't believe that we lost. And I said, and he goes, if you wouldn't have done that, I think we could have won. I said, well, Braxton, all of those things that you just said were rules that when Daddy said he was going to coach, I said that I was going to follow. And I said, if we would have won, would it have felt as good knowing that we won doing wrong as it does right now knowing that we did right? even though we lost. <laughs> I think that he had like a very internal struggle with that because I think he definitely wanted to win. But I said, if we won doing what was wrong, why does it even matter? And it was interesting to, to me to see that as a six-year-old, this is the concept that he grasped in that moment, is he would rather do right 
and lose, which is a big thing for Braxton Michael Norris, who absolutely cannot stand to lose, than to do wrong and win. And isn't it interesting that as a, as a little kid, he understands that principle, but for whatever reason, as an adult, sometimes what we do is we justify our wrong to win than we ever do say, you know what, I would rather do right and maybe not get that job promotion. I would rather stay in principle and do what God has told me to do and not receive the blessing that maybe the world would, ca would cast onto me. And he says this, if you suffer for righteousness' sake, why does it matter? But then he says this, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That verse is so challenging, but watch this. The word sanctify is the word separate, which means this. He says, make a place for the Lord God in your hearts. I don't know it was until this week that I was studying that I realized the power of that word in this verse. Do you want to know what most of us do? Most of us walk around and we say, oh, the Lord has complete control of my life. He doesn't even have a place in most people's lives. He is simply a ticket that has been punched that gets them to heaven. And he says this, sanctify, separate, give God a spot in the, your hearts. Meaning this, that for most of us, we make bold statements like, the Lord has my heart. We sing songs about, uh, about God having all of our heart and I surrender all. And the truth is, is that God doesn't even have control over our finances. God doesn't have control over our bank accounts. God doesn't have control over if God tomorrow, for some reason, were to slip in and maybe remove a job from you. There would be a lot more bitterness toward God than there would be trust. Why? Because we assume that God is working against us rather than working for us. And here's what he says. He says, sanctify, separate a place for the Lord God in your hearts. Why? And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you of reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Watch this. He says that there should be something, there should be hope in you that should cause people to ask the question. Sometimes what we do with this verse is we assume that we have to be ready always to give an answer to everyone who comes up and asks us. But that's not what the verse says. The verse says to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Meaning this, that no one is going to walk up to you because of your head knowledge. They're going to walk up to you and ask you of the hope that is within you because of your actions. And so often what we do is we complicate the simple rather than simplifying the complicated. And what we have done with this passage is this. We've taken it to a level to where we say, well, before I ever love my neighbor, before I ever do soul winning, or before I ever ask someone to come sit with me in church, or before I ever do any of those things, I have to know all of this. And is it wrong to know all of this? No, it's absolutely 100% right to know all of this. But here's what the verse and the passage is saying. It's saying that if you do all of this, there's going to be some people that come and ask you about this. It doesn't say the opposite. It doesn't say, well, get everything in your Christian life figured out. Make sure that you know every answer to every little thing that someone could ask you because then you get to do this. No, it says do this. Be courteous, be pitiful, offer blessing for evil, eschew evil, and pursue that which is good. Do all of these things so that someone will come and ask you about the hope that is within you. And the impact of compassion is this, is that knowing all of the right answers with the wrong attitude will not change someone's life. But having the right attitude and then knowing the answer is what can change someone.
I want you to go to Jude chapter number 22 to solidify this. Jude chapter number 22, and then we'll be done. Jude 22, the Bible says this. It says, And of some have compassion, making a difference. Knowing everything there is to know about Christianity is not what makes the difference. Compassion makes the difference. So here's the question for you today. How much compassion have you shown to those around you this week? How big of an impact, how big of a difference have you made in someone else's life because of the compassion that you have shown them? You're an employer. Someone's late to work, okay? That crawls under my skin, okay? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty type 1, Enneagram 1, type A, Enneagram 1 perfectionist, okay? But someone's late to, late to work, okay? They know that you're a Christian. You walk, they walk in and, you idiot. It's 8.02. You were supposed to be here at 8. Do you know how much work you could have gotten done in those two minutes? That cup of coffee, you're, you don't get coffee today. Okay, that cup of coffee that you're about to make, did you make a difference? Oh, they might get there at 8 o'clock. Congratulations. You saved, you got two more minutes of work out of them, all right? You're a college student. The person that you walk by week in, day in and day out, could you show them some compassion this week? The person who rubs you the wrong way, the person who cuts you off in traffic, and your bumper sticker says, I love Jesus, and I will run you off the road, okay? Did you make a difference? Might make them think twice about cutting someone off. But compassion is the only thing that makes the difference. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's pray and we'll ask the Lord to bless.